do not know ourselves as we truly are, the real nature of the self, which is Atman in Advaita Vedanta. Atman is nothing but you, yourself. We do not know ourselves as we truly are. And that is the source of all our problems. All our suffering, all the, the misery of the human condition, the limitations of the human condition. They are all because we do not know what a human being is. I do not know what I truly am. And I, the, what's worse is I think I know. That's what really prevents me from investigating it. So, Advaita Vedanta says, if we would really know ourselves as we truly are, we would see that we are an immortal spirit, beyond death, beyond suffering. We would realize that. We are that right now. Sat Chit Ananda, absolute existence, absolute consciousness, absolute bliss. That's what we already are, not knowing it, we are in what is called samsara, this world of becoming and suffering and strife and struggle. And if we would know it, then we would get, we would be free of suffering right here, right now. that our real nature, the Atman, existence, consciousness, bliss, is said to be beyond words, beyond thought. Avang Manasa Gochara in Sanskrit, beyond language and beyond conception by the mind. If that is so, how do you teach it? After all, Advaita Vedanta, what is it except words? It's, it's, there's a text, Upanishads. The Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, they are words. And the words are attempting to express something that is not expressible by words. How do you teach the unteachable? How do you express the inexpressible? That is the central problem of Advaita Vedanta. If that is so, you can't think about it, you, it's, it's not an object to the senses, you cannot talk about it, then how can you teach it? Do you see the problem? If you see the problem, the answer will make sense. Otherwise, it will seem like an exercise in futility. What are you trying to do? This is a problem. Then how do you teach such a, such a thing? Our real uh, nature, what we truly are, is beyond the language, is beyond thought, beyond the senses. So isn't it something that's going to be purely speculative? Isn't it something that's going to be unknown and unknowable? And Vedanta says, no. Notice one thing. There's one redeeming feature in this whole mess. That it is yourself. It is you. You are continuously revealed. You are being continuously revealed. You are there. You are you. Because of the nature that it is the Atman, the Self, it is continuously self-revealed. The Sanskrit word is Svaprakasha, self-revealed. Hence, though it cannot be known by the mind, though it cannot be known by language, it can still be intuitively caught. It's still there. It's continuously shining forth. It needs only to be distinguished from all that we have covered it up with all that we are mistaking it for. Once the distinction is made clear, you are intuitively expected to grasp. I am this. Oh, this is what I am. Aham Brahmasmi.
Shravana Manana Nididhyasana. Shravana is listen to the teachings. And listening is complete, you know. It's not passive listening, it's active listening. So that afterwards you can say back to others or to yourself, this is what the teacher said or this is what the text said. Then listening is complete. Second, manana, which is thinking or reflection on what you have heard. You've already got the material, now you reflect upon it. What is this reflection? I, have, I know what you said. I know what the text said. But I have many questions now. I have many doubts. I don't get it. I have many objections to this. So you put forth your objections. Give vent to your reactions to the teaching. And discuss it. Maybe with the teacher. Maybe with yourself. Maybe with others. The texts also have many, many questions. So you go through this phase of reflection. Questioning. And the, this phase, the second phase is complete. When do you know it's complete? When you begin to feel, I not only know the teaching, but now I'm beginning to get it. There is clarity. There is conviction. I get it. I understand. Yes, it is so. Then what else remains after understanding? Usually not, in a classroom situation, not much more remains after understanding. But here, the problem is, one might still feel that I understand it. But it's not a living reality to me yet. I mean, it's something theoretical, something uh, philosophical. I have learned a clever philosophy, but um, so what? My life is still... You promised I will overcome suffering. I'm still suffering. You promised that I will, I will attain peace and bliss. Not much of it. Now, earlier there was worldly problem and worldly suffering. Now there is philosophical problem and suffering also. So you have added to it. Why am I not enlightened? One more thing to do, to my to-do list. So to convert... Clarity into realization. The third stage is there, which is called Nididhyasana or meditation. It's a process of assimilating the truth. What you have realized, what you have learned, and what you now you are convinced it's the truth. Make it into a living truth, Swami Vivekananda says, until it tingles with every drop of your blood that it must be so. I am that. Notice something that the body changes. Say, so, yeah, so notice the body when you you were a baby at one time, the body was a, a young boy or girl at one time, a teenager at another time, a young person, and you say, I was that baby, I was the teenager, I was this young person, now I'm this middle aged person or the senior person. The body has changed so much, tremendously so. Doctors will tell you that most of the cells of the body have been replaced again and again and again. And I feel I am the same. I am that one. We say sometimes, how quickly time has passed. I remember being in high school and now I am retiring from my job. And I remember it so clearly. Now notice how much the body has changed. And yet you feel you are the same person, the same being in this tremendously changing body. How can the unchanging and changing be the same thing? It's a simple point, but if you reflect upon it, how can you say, I am this body, and yet it changes completely, and yet I claim I am the same person, baby, little boy, or a girl, or teenager, young person, middle-aged, I am the same person, and yet the body is not at all the same. How can you both be same and not same? How can you both be changing and not changing? Think about it. One, changing, not changing. In Sanskrit, nishkriya, uh, nirvikara, savikara. Nirvikara, unchanging. Savikara, with change. They cannot be the same thing. You, whatever you are, you can't be the changing body. the body do you experience the body what's the point in this usually the experiencer and the experienced are two different entities I experience by experience I mean I see I see this brochure now this brochure is separate from my eyes which I used to see the brochure they're two different entities in fact the only thing that the eyes cannot see are the eyes themselves they can see everything except the eyes themselves 
So what you see is different from the seer. Two different entities. What you experience is different from the experiencer. Subject and object are generally different. Now the question is, when you look at your body, can you experience it? Yes, I can see it. I can touch it. If it's very hot and uh, humid, you can even smell it. And you can taste it, hear it. All the five senses operate very well on the body. The body is an object to all of our senses. Body is an object. I am the subject. I am the experiencer. Body is experienced. Subject, object. Being experiencer and experience, seer and the seen, they must be different. You, whatever you are, and the body which you experience, you must be different in some sense. Otherwise, you could not see the body as an object. We clearly see it as an object. In Sanskrit, drashta drishya, literally seer and seen. But seeing does not mean only the eyes, all the senses. The body is an object to all the senses. You can see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it. That being so, the body is an object. You are the subject. You are the seer. The body is seen. The two must be different. Whatever you are, you are not the body. You are the experiencer of the body. You are conscious, the body is not conscious. In Sanskrit, Chetana Jara. What do I mean by this? None of this is theoretical. We are inviting you, the teacher invites you again and again to take a look right now and see whether it is right or not. Notice that when you are aware of the, when you see the body, this is related to a second point, when you see the body, on which side is consciousness? Am I conscious of the body or is the body conscious of me? What do you think? When you look at, look at the hand, when you look at your own hand, do you feel I am looking at the hand or do you feel that the hand is looking at me? That would be weird if the hand says hello. Clearly I am aware of the hand. Awareness is on my side. I am aware of the hand. You would say so. The same thing applies to the other hand, to the feet and to the belly and the head and the entire body which is a collection of parts. I am aware of those parts. I am aware of the body as a whole. The body is not aware of me. Hence consciousness is on my side, not on the side of the body. So I am Chetana in Sanskrit and the body is Jara. Jara means insentient. So body is insentient. Body appears to be sentient because I am present in it. I lend consciousness to the body. But I am conscious of the body. Consciousness is on my side, Chaitanya Jara. Aging belongs to whom? To the body, not to you. 
not to the unchanging experiencing conscious entity which you are rather the body which ages in your light in your experience physical disease belongs to the body the moment you say physical attributes old young tall short um, skinny fat whatever body not you so all of these things they belong to the body and i am the experiencer thereof the subject thereof what am i clearly i am something here if i am not the body i am something subtler than the body inner to the body in sanskrit pratyak sukshma subtle pratyak inward what is inward topanishad says anyu antaratma pranamaya the atman the self is subtler inward and it is a very systematic development what is subtler than the body said catch hold of the breath am i the not literally the breath but the life forces the vital forces the physiological forces which today which we call physiology which sustains the living body am i life i am not the physical body all right but am i life in this body so am i life and the same yukti can be applied the three th- um, things i said changing unchanging do the does the prana change Yes, it does. Sometimes you feel healthy. Sometimes you feel sick. Sometimes you feel hungry. Sometimes satiated. Sometimes you are energetic. Sometimes tired. These are the tides of prana surging through the living body. They change, and you are the unchanging experience. Because don't you say, "I who was feeling energetic in the morning, I feel tired now." I the same I. The energetic I was not different, and the tired I is not different. I am the same person who felt energetic, who feels tired now. Prana has changed. I have not changed. So changing and unchanging, I cannot be the prana. aware of the breath yes if you are aware of the breath the breath is an object and you are the subject the breath is the seeing drishya you are the seer drashta the two cannot be the same you cannot be the prana you cannot be the breath because it is ob- it is an object you are the subject it is the seen you are the seer on which side is consciousness you the observer or the breath which is observed you the observer clearly i am conscious of the breath i am conscious sentient the breath is insentient i am the observer the breath is observed i am the unchanging the breath or prana in general is changing hence i cannot be prana and upanishad says all right you are not prana all the time from the morning till now how many times sleepy and then awake after a cup of coffee or how many times curious and bored and delighted and irritated and how 
how many times the mind has changed in the course of half, not even half a day, quarter of a day from the morning till now. So the mind changes. And I am the same one who was sleepy, who was alert, who was bored, who was curious, so on. The same subject and a changing mind, nirvikara, savikara. I cannot, you cannot be the same as the mind. It's a changing thing. Can you objectify the mind? Can you experience, can, can the mind be something that is seen? Yes, there's something called introspection. I'm aware of the states of my mind, right? When I look inside, I feel happy. I'm aware that I'm happy. I feel sad. I'm aware that I'm sad. I can't understand what you're saying. I'm aware that I cannot understand what I'm saying. I cannot understand. So, all of these, the states of the mind are clearly revealed to me. It's an object and the subject. Is the mind conscious or are you conscious? All right, let me suggest the thought. 2 plus 2 is 4 or A, B, C, D, anything. 2 plus 2 is 4. Now hold on to the thought. 2 plus 2 is 4. Now ask yourself this question. Is 2 plus 2, 4 aware of me or am I aware of 2 plus 2, 4? The thought 2 plus 2, 4, clearly inside you, look, at, look in, into your experience. You are aware. You are the one thinking 2 plus 2, 4. 2 plus 2, 4 is not thinking you. Clearly not. It's impossible. So, mind is a series of thoughts, a stream of thoughts, and you are aware of it. It is not aware of you, whatever you are. Hence, the mind is not conscious. You are conscious. Consciousness is on your side. Sentient, insentient, chit jara, chetana jara. Because of these reasons, I am not the mind also. What a tremendous thing I am saying. If I am not the body, if I am not the prana, if I am not the mind, then I am the experiencer of the body, young, old, uh, uh, skinny, overweight. Uh, I am the experiencer of the prana, healthy, sick, whatever. I am the experiencer of the mind, um, happy, sad, curious, bored, whatever it is. But I am not it. I am not it. It's an object to me. It's an app on, 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 on your phone. It's, it's, a, it's a device. It's a subtle thing, very powerful, but it's not me. The implications are tremendous for our, our, our internal life actually, right now. But go deeper. Then what am I? And the Upanishad, Taittiriya Upanishad, it makes a distinction between intellect and mind. Intellect and mind are basically the same entity, but based on function. Because we are using intellect, hopefully, to understand all this. Then the Upanishad says, are you intellect? Are you intelligence? In Sanskrit, buddhi. And we think, all right, I am intelligence. Anyuantaratma vijnanamaya. And it goes on like that. You can use the same three yuktis. Does the intellect change? Yes, it does. I'm trying to understand a math problem. And then I understand it. It changed. Um, are you, can you observe the intellect? Yes, you can. Are you conscious or is the intellect conscious? Applying the same technique, you will see I am conscious of the intellect. So I cannot be the intellect. And the Upanishad goes one more step deeper beyond the intellect. Please follow in your own experience. If you try to go beyond the intellect, you will hit a blank wall. Blankness, nothing. 
body, prana, mind, intellect. Try to go beyond that blankness. That blankness which we experience in deep sleep. The Upanishad calls it Anandamaya, that sheet of bliss, for certain reasons. Are you that? We always wear this immortal being, always free. This is what is coined into God in religions. But this is our real nature. This is the meaning of that thou art. This is the meaning of Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. This is the meaning of Chidananda Rupa Shivoham. I am of the nature of Shiva. We realize that. And that, my friends, is this taste of freedom which Advaita Vedanta wants to give us. Physical body, vital body, uh, subtle body, that means the vital body and mental body, uh, the intellectual body and the blankness beyond that. Now what dies at death? Clearly the first one, physical body, which is burnt or buried or whatever. But there is no proof that the mind, the subtle body, prana, mana, buddhi, that they die. There is no proof of that. I am making a simple statement. But it's actually pretty stunning. There is a trick which we 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 don't notice. Whenever we, when you are when I'm talking to you or you're talking to me, we have a clear sense of talking to a person, right? We don't have a sense I'm talking to a, a body. Yet, so I'm talking to you. I mean the person you. You're talking to me. You mean the person me. Yet when I die, we say the person is uh, it is dead. It's basically the body which is dead. You are refer now referring to me as the body. The person me is no longer accessible to you. Somehow we have taken it that the person is not there anymore. But how do you know that the person is not there? Anyway, to answer your question, the person which we call the person the subtle body. Subtle body is a combination of the uh, pranamaya, manomaya, vijnanamaya. And anandamaya is called the causal body. Atman is beyond all of that. So what happens at death is the physical body is destroyed. As Krishna says, like taking of a suit of old clothes and throwing it away and put on, putting on a suit of new clothes. So we get new physical bodies, but the subtle body continues. So those traits, miserliness or whatever, they are in the subtle body. The mind clearly has qualities. The mind clearly has traits. Each of our minds is different. Different tendencies, thoughts, desires. But the Atman beyond that, the awareness in itself, has no distinguishing quality. So that Atman is the same in all of us. The minds are different. It is the minds which transmigrate. Or to be more technically correct, subtle bodies and causal bodies which transmigrate from um, lifetime to lifetime.
Atman, again remember this is Advaita Vedanta. So Atman is ever the same. The conclusion of Vedanta is Atman is neither a doer nor an experiencer. Na karta na bhokta. The Atman, what you feel, I am acting. But that's only in connection to the mind or the prana. I breathe in. But then I am already connected to mind and intellect where a thought of breathing in comes in. Then I execute it and I feel that I am breathing in. So all action is possible only when the Atman is identified with considers itself to be one with body and mind. There is a stage when we realize all activity is in nature and the Atman is just a witness. This is one verse in the Bhagavad Gita which is repeated three times. Prakrityeva karmani kriyamanani sarvasha yapashyati tathatmanam akartaram sapashyati This is an answer to your question. You notice that every action is actually done by nature. Here nature means body, brain, uh, all of this, the, even the mind, the breath, and the witness consciousness. Consciousness just lights it up. So then, then you realize that consciousness is the non-doer. Atman is non-doer. Even this is not the final state. This is the Sankhyan state, um, an in-between intermediate state, where you realize your separation from the universe of nature and actions. It's like the light on the stage, which reveals everything. When I am there and giving a speech, it's revealed by the light. When we are all gone, the stage is empty, it's revealed by the same light. The light doesn't do any of it, but it reveals everything. Similarly, in waking and dreaming, things are going on and consciousness reveals it. When in deep sleep, nothing is going on and that nothing going on is also revealed by consciousness. So consciousness in itself does not act, but it reveals all action and the absence of action. And in the state of ignorance, Consciousness is identified with action and the absence of action and thinking, I am the doer, I am the non-doer, I am I'm doing, not doing, all these things, they are superimposed. In Sanskrit it's called Adhyasa, superimposition. In reality, non-doer. What the Buddhists call the void, we call it, the Vedantins, we call it the full, the whole. Um, in fact, what they call the whole, we call the whole. H-O-L-E and W-H-O-L-E. <laughs> so, uh, the Shunya and the Purna, he uses the word Shunya and Purna. What the Buddhists call Shunya, void, we call the Purnam, the whole, the, um, you can call it the infinite. It is true, it's at the same time emptiness itself and it's, it's also the Plinam, it's, it's everything. Um, 
it is the now but the not the now of the present in the series of past present and future not that kind of now yeah it's it's not it's not relative it it is one reality in which time the relative time passes it, it, it seems to pass uh, about your last remark if you still leave it at prakriti purusha it's unresolved it's still duality correct sankhya is a strong dualistic system uh, consciousness and matter two different things interacting a conscious not not decart's mind and matter dualism but uh, a consciousness matter dualism and mind is also part of matter how do you know mind is part of matter what we just did is mind an object yes object is what is called matter in vedanta so anything that is an object to you can you objectify it is does it appear to you as an object then it is matter so mind is also matter according to vedanta mind and matter together as prakriti and consciousness apart from that this dualism of consciousness and nature prakriti and purusha where sankhya stops the buddha resolves it by concentrating entirely on prakriti which is in flux a changing prakriti and that's all he does not talk at all about purusha keep silent about that if you realize that everything that you talk about as yourself is just flux is just prakriti you will be free nirvana And then he says Shankara does exactly the opposite he resolves prakriti back into purusha showing that all this changing universe is an appearance in the unchanging consciousness if you realize that you will be free both ways it works <laughs>